It looks fine. Yeah, it's just for me. It blocks my uh, presentation on my end. Oh. There it goes. Okay. Okay, can everyone see this? Yes. yes. Awesome. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to present today. So the talk I'll be presenting is called the ABCs of Native Bees. And this is primarily um, bees from California. So again, just a little bit about myself. I'm a artist, also a photographer, as well as a speaker. And you can see me doing all three of those things right here. As far as artwork, I primarily create pieces in ballpoint pen, but I also do sugar. So these three are ballpoint pen pieces. And it's speaking, that's what I do pretty regularly. I'm doing it again today. So you can see me speaking here. Um, as far as photography, I primarily photograph three things. I photograph bees and their ecosystems, which you can see up here uh, in the upper right-hand corner. I also photograph the plants that they have relationships with, as well as landscapes, um, just to basically get up-to-date changes of their ecosystems, because there's a lot of places in California that are being developed. So if you visit a place 10 years later, it's kind of nice to see what it'll look like over that span. And uh, here's a picture of me in the Trinity Alps, which I went to in 2021 to find an endangered bee. I uh, also went to Belize last year to photograph a nighttime bee. And I'm called a community scientist. And a lot of people call a community scientist a citizen scientist. Um, but community is, is something that is just considered a lot more inclusive. So a community scientist is a amateur scientist who conducts scientific research in a field that they don't hold a degree in. Um, just because of the changing language um, it has changed from someone who doesn't hold a degree to whether or not someone is documented or not. So uh, community people feel in the English speaking world in the United States is a lot more inclusive. So again, what I do is I uh, document bees in their environment, uh, behavior, notate their plants that they're on. And I also keep track of things like times, dates, and weather. So each location I visit, I actually have an Excel spreadsheet that I update every year with those things. So how I got started. I don't know if anyone has seen this quote before, but the first time I saw it was on Facebook. If the bee disappeared off the surface of the globe, then man would only have four years of life left. No more bees, no more pollination, no more plants, no more animals, no more man. It's attributed to Albert Einstein. Um, so it turns out this quote is actually not true. Yeah. And uh, Einstein never even said it. It was a quote that was actually made up in the 90s. Uh, <laughs> But uh, it's it's what got me started because I, like pretty much everyone else who saw this, thought it was true. Einstein had said it. And I also thought, hey, this is about honeybees. So I got into honeybees because I was like, oh, I need to save the bees. And those were the ones that clearly needed to be saved. Um, so I actually started going out and just taking photos of these bees, just a lot of photos of just exclusively honeybees, just a lot of photos. And then I took this photo and it's clearly a bee, but it's not a honeybee. So I had no idea what it was. So I ended up going back to my beekeeping friends and asking them, cause I was like, beekeepers are the bee experts. Um, and they had no idea. So I ended up going back to Facebook and found this group called Native Bees of the Americas. And there were people in there called militologists and militologists are scientists who study bees. And they pretty much instantly told me, this is a native bee, this is an andrina, which is a mining bee. And it was the first time I'd heard the word militologist and also native bees. Um, but one of the very first things they told me was that it was actually native bees, not honeybees that were potentially threatened or endangered. Um, so this kind of completely changed everything I was doing. I was like, wow, I spent a lot of time on bees that didn't actually need our protection. Um, so I ended up going back to a lot of the locations I'd gone to before to try and find these native bees. But for whatever reason, I was just having no luck. And I had no idea why. Um, that was until the horticulturalist at the Crescent Farm posted pictures on the LA Arboretum's Facebook page. Uh, so the Crescent Farm is about a acre of 
pretty much nothing but native plants. And he posted a picture of about four to five species of native bees. And I was like, okay, this is weird. I've been looking for a while. Why are, why are there so many native bees here? And it turns out, first day I went there, I took these photos. So just to go over these bees a little bit. So this is a female Melisotis bee or female longhorn bee. You can tell she's a female because she has the pollen on her back legs. This is a male of the same species. So these are Melisotis agilis. Um, the males have long antenna and they don't collect pollen. This is also a uh, variant of the same species with uh, dark eyes instead of green and white hair instead of orange. Um, and this is a very, very common sweat bee called a Halictus legatus. And here's another female uh, last day blossom dialectus. You can tell these are female because they have pollen on their back legs. But um, yeah, basically after visiting the garden, I realized the reason why there are so many native bees here was because of the native plants. So I'm sure a lot of you guys know this already, probably like walking you through something you, you're very, very familiar with, but what are native plants? A plant is considered native if it has occurred naturally in a particular region, ecosystem, or habitat without human introduction. So what that means is a plant could be, let's say native to all of the United States. It could be native to just California or even just your zip code. So native plants and native bees, they can potentially have a symbiotic relationship with each other, which means one or both can rely on each other to survive. So save the native bees also means save the native plants. And saving native plants helps save so many more pollinators than just bees, um, birds, bats, butterflies, and more. So also too, I feel like I, I really need to get into the different between honeybees and native bees because there's a lot So honeybees are not threatened or endangered. Native bees are potentially threatened or endangered. Honeybees, the ones that are in the US are from Europe. Native bees are from where they currently reside. So just like the native plants, they could be native to all of the United States, just California, or even just as small as like your zip code. Um, honeybees drink water provided by people. Native bees get all of their hydration for plants, so you don't need to leave water dishes out for them. Honeybees are generalist pollinators. So this means they don't have a special relationship. They don't rely on certain plants to survive. So they'll try and pollinate everything. But since they don't have that specialist relationship, they actually don't pollinate anything all that well. They have about a 5% pollination rate. So native bees can also be generalist pollinators, but some of them can also be specialist pollinators, meaning they'll only pollinate potentially one family of plants. So honeybees are also detrimental to native bees. So uh, the two primary ways is one, they'll actually outcompete native bees for resources. So since these bees are from Europe, they're used to colder weather. So they'll be out earlier in the morning. They're also swarm around bushes. So they'll rob a lot of the resources from plants. Also, um, Honeybees have a mite called a varroa mite that infects them. So a lot of the adult honeybees are actually carriers. Um, so they're not physically affected by this mite. And what the mite does is it attaches to a developing bee, honeybee. And the um, if the adult honeybee is physically affected, they'll have small wings. So since a honeybee is a generalist pollinator, the ones that are infected with the virus, but not physically, they'll actually visit a lot of different plants and they'll actually infect the pollen from those plants. And it's been found that bumblebees, which are pretty closely related to honeybees because they're in the same family, have been picking up that pollen and taking it back to their nests. And I don't know if you guys have seen any of these videos online of people finding bumblebees with very tiny wings. It's because of their close proximity to honeybees. Um, and I'll get into this a little bit later, but native bees are also threatened by climate change. Honeybees live in colonies. Native bees, 70% are ground nesting, 30% are cavity nesting, and about 90% are solitary, meaning they live by themselves. Um, so I'm sure like a lot of you guys know this already, but I just decided to put these uh, taxonomic categories here just because I'm gonna be saying a lot of bee names. And typically what we say is just the, uh, the genus, which you can see right here, second from the bottom, and then the species. So I decided to put homo sapiens up here because we're all people. So um, homo is 
our genus sapiens is our species. So when I say a uh, bee name, I'll be saying the genus and the species. So same with plants when you say their scientific names. So an example here is Perdita nasuda. So Perdita is the genus and nasuda is the species. Same with the plant, Ariagonum inflatum, which is a buckwheat. Um, so what's really cool about this bee, this was my very first specialist pollinator and I actually found them in Death Valley when I was doing some astrophotography. And this is one of those bees that's really cool. If you wanna look for a bee, um, look for a specific specialist, you can look for the plant. So this is a plant that you'll find out in like the Mojave Desert or Joshua Tree. So um, this bee will always be on the plant. And what's really cool about this, and I think this is a kind of great example of contributions for community science. So one thing that was sort of just not known about this, this bee, this is the male. So the facial feature, he has like a little duck bill on his face. It's called the clippiest facial feature. Um, no one knew what this facial feature was for because the way bees are studied now, a lot of the times is they're pan trapped. So someone will put out a pan with some liquid in there and all sorts of insects will fly in and they'll collect them when they've died, take them back to a lab and look at them under a microscope. So no one had seen um, how what this bee using this facial feature. Um, but the way I work and the way a lot of community scientists work is we just go out and photograph. So I actually got photos of this bee using the facial feature within about 30 minutes of seeing this bee. So the males will actually use that duck face and they'll actually trap the female's antenna on either side of the clippiest facial feature to try and stop her from mating, uh, flying off so they can mate with her. Um, so yeah, this bee, I think it's been known since like 1910. So it's about a hundred, a little over a hundred years where no one knew what that facial feature was for. Um, but what's also really cool about this buckwheat is when you see it, you'll notice Everything kind of has a similar, uh, whenever you see this bee, it's always on this desert dandelion. That's one way people actually ID this bee to species because it has such a specialist relationship with this flower. So this is a Calliopsis pule on a desert dandelion. Um, and this is another bee that I actually found by looking for the plant again. So this is called a Perdita minima. And it's the smallest known bee in North America, potentially the smallest bee in the world. And if you look at the quarter in the lower left-hand corner here, the flowers on there. So this bee is about two millimeters, very, very tiny bee. Um, and I just, I think it's really cool to actually see these as living creatures. And um, this is also an example of ecosystems can be very small um, in the desert or in like xeric regions. Um, a lot of drier regions, everything is smaller. So this is a bee um, that also lives on this exact same sand mat as the Perdita minima. And this one's about, I'd say maybe three millimeters. And one thing that's really interesting about this bee is it's a Lassiad blossom dialectus. And it's known as a bee that's kind of impossible to ID species. But with more people going out there with better cameras, you can actually ID these to species without collecting them in pans. So this was the first dialectus I actually ever had ID'd to species. Um, but then I also want to bring up these other because creatures live on a two foot by two foot and mat flowers. And they think of ecosystems, they'll think of maybe just like the Santa Monica Mountains or maybe the whole Mojave Desert, but can just be a patch of flowers on your sidewalk. And um, what's also cool here is this creature in the middle is a mite. It's called a Paratarsodomus macropalpus. It's about 0.5 to 0.7 millimeters. And it's the fastest land animal on earth relative to its size. So if it was the size of a human, it'd run about 1300 miles an hour. So pretty fast, especially compared to a cheetah, which would run about 60 miles an hour. And other examples of symbiotic relationships. So it's not just the bee world, it's also the wasp world. Um, so this is another wasp that's identified by the plant that it's on, California brittle bush. Um, but also it's not just the insect world. I'm sure people are familiar with this one, especially since Finding Nemo or just, there's a lot of naturalists in this group. So uh, the sea anemone and the clownfish, the clownfish gets protection from the sea anemone and the sea anemone gets food because the clownfish attracts a lot of um, food 
to it. Um, so that's a, another symbiotic relationship. But also, um, I want to bring up this one because this is, I feel like, a symbiotic relationship that a lot of people are familiar with. And it was recently severely impacted by climate change in Australia because uh, the koala, the only food that they eat is a eucalyptus leaf. And in, it was like 2019, 2020, I think, um, there's a, a oceanic dipole that happens every year. And it's basically between Australia and Eastern Africa. But during that season, because of climate change, it intensified and Australia just became very, very dry and had extensive fires and Eastern Australia or Eastern Africa had extensive flooding. So it impacted the symbiotic relationship because a lot of the eucalyptus burned in the fire. And then the koalas that survived the fire, they didn't have anything to eat. So a lot of them ended up starving to death. And I know this sounds kind of random to bring up in a talk about bees, but I feel like this is something that's it's something that people paid attention to. And it's because I feel like a lot of times when animals are cute and fluffy, people, they grab their attention. But the same thing is happening with symbiotic relationships with bees as well. But bees for a lot of people aren't cute and fluffy. Like a lot of people just run in the opposite direction or don't really care. So this is the same thing that's actually happening close to home. So what can we do? There's a lot of things we can do. Um, but I'd say the first thing the easiest thing we can do is document to raise awareness because this could actually be done in your own backyard or whenever you're on a hike. Um, also plant native plants in our yard. So a great app that you can have in when you're in your backyard or on a hike is iNaturalist. I'm sure a lot of you guys have this already. Um, but yeah, just take pictures of whatever organism that you see. A lot of times people are making like really cool discoveries in their backyards. I also create, so many people take pictures of honeybees, so I kind of wanted to eliminate those so people can um, look for what's native in your area. Also brings me to Arlington Garden, great garden in Pasadena. You guys should check it out. If you haven't been, it's, it's free. You can go any time of day. Um, so what's really interesting about this is I like to bring up this bee, which is a very, very common bee. So this is a Xylocopa sonorina. It's a male carpenter bee. And the last time still, the last time that I saw this bee in the garden was 2018. And I thought the bee had left the garden. So this is an example of what can happen if like um, there's only one person looking. I might have thought the bee had completely disappeared, but they started doing nature walks in 2021 and they've been seeing the bee regularly. So this is something that can potentially be happening or like a reflection of the rest of California or just the west of the world if there's not a lot of people out there looking like even just going out with the, the iNaturalist app on their phone there's things that we were potentially missing. Um, Santa Monica Mountains uh, basically just with this one I kind of want to bring up different plant associations with bees so if you start to see uh, morning glories um, these are certain bees that'll start to appear around the same time. This is called a diadacia by tuberculata so it's a ground nesting bee this is a female. You can tell she's a female because she has the thick humus hair back legs. This is where she puts the pollen. And these bees are really cool. So they're solitary, but they live in aggregations. So it's kind of like a neighborhood where they have their own houses. So the females will actually create these little chimneys called turrets that they use to protect their burrows from Paris dry eggs in there. Or um, So this is a female with her legs sticking out of the turret. Um, her little feet there. I think it's just really cute. Um, and this is a video. Hope it plays. So this is a parking lot in Mishimoqua Trailhead. So this is what an aggregation of solitary bees looks like. And this is actually the biggest aggregation I've ever seen. And I know a lot of times people are very, very scared of bees, especially getting stung. But one thing that's really great about native bees is they rarely ever sting you. So you can actually walk through this aggregation and not worry about getting stung. But yeah, I think there, there must have been like 100,000 bees here. It was just kind of crazy. Very cool. Uh, oh, and my friend uh, James Carey was the one who actually filmed, filmed this. Yeah. Okay. 
go to the next slide. All right, so some other bees that'll show up at the same time as the, <clears throat> the morning glory. Uh, so we have a Eucera bee, which is a longhorn bee. This one's different than Melisotis because you'll see it has the black eyes, also has black antenna instead of the bicolored antenna, like the Melisotis will have orange and black or brown. Um, this is Dephoria bee uh, sleeping in the morning glory. So both of these bees, the males will actually sleep in those flowers. So if you go out really early in the morning, these flowers like open and close with the sun, you might find a lot of these little guys just tucked in the flowers. Um, some other flowers uh, that you should look for in the <clears throat> early part of the year, deerweed, and then also different flowers in the Asteraceae family. So when these flowers start blooming, you'll start to see these bees. So this top one is a Anthophora ed edwarzii. Um, this is a Anthophora crotchii. So you can tell again, this is a female because she has the plumose hair or the branched hair on the back leg for collecting pollen. This is a male. He doesn't have that. He also has a clippiest facial feature. It's not like a duck bill like the other bee, but again, the facial plate. He also has these little fans on his hand that he uses to cover up the female's eyes when he's mating with her. Um, another really similar looking bee, this is a Habropoda depressia, um, which I think is depressed bee. Uh, you can tell this is a male again because he has the clippiest facial feature. This is a hoplitis bee, and she actually collects pollen on the underside of her abdomen instead of the back leg like an anthophora. A um, couple of other bees. This is a parasitic bee or a cuckoo bee. It's called a Brachymelica californica. And this, is, this bee is really cool. So sometimes you'll see them sleeping in groups on your plants. They actually are disguised to look like bird poop. So maybe check out your plants. If you see bird poop, it might be this bee. Um, this is a male leaf cutter bee. Um, this is a, another hoplitis bee, and you can actually see the pollen. side of her abdomen. This is an Osmia bee, familiar with what's going on there. Um, so this is a very, very beautiful, rich, biodiverse ecosystem. And because it's so beautiful, a lot of people have actually just started moving there. And with the fires that are starting to happen there pretty regularly, um, homeowners have asked the um, an organization who um, is in charge of the habitat there to start going through with like tractors or bulldozers and start taking down a lot of the native fauna, uh, flora. So this is actually an area that I was visiting really, really regularly. And I never actually got a photo of what it looked like before it was taken down with a tractor. So this was from um, 2021, July, 4th of July weekend. And you can see the tractor tracks here. Um, but what's really sad about this is I had actually been visiting for about six months at this point and had photographed over 40 species of bees. So these are some of the bees that I'd actually photographed here. And I was hoping they'd come back last year, but again, the conservancy came back with the, the tractors or bulldozer and the morning glories and the, um, the mallows that were starting to grow back, they took them down again. So I haven't seen a single bee at this location. So this is just kind of a reflection of what's happening all over California. And another thing I wanna to mention too, um, this this from last year, but uh, I think it's really cool um, biodiversity map. So this is one of the first maps in the US that basically reflects like all imperiled creatures. So not just the ones that are very, very popular, like the koala in Australia, for example. Um, so this looks at species of bees, butterflies, fish, mussels, crayfish, flowering plants, a lot of different things like that. And if you'll notice, the uh, California is more red than most of the US. That's because California is a biodiversity hotspot. Um, so again, red, not a lot going on in the center. Um, but the Biden administration is working on a plan called 30 by 30, which is um, protecting 30% of the US by 2030. Right now, about 13% of the US is protected. Um, and also want to mention too why California is such a biodiverse hotspot. So we're in a climate called a Mediterranean climate, which is basically when we're next to a large cold body of water and then we have a uh, desert on the eastern side. And if you notice here, these are all Mediterranean climates high, highlighted in green. They're always on the western side of the continent. So uh, Mediterranean climates only take up about 2% of the 
Earth's land mass, but we also have 20% of the world's biodiversity. So in relation to bees, in the United States, we have uh, 4, 000, a little over 4,000 species of bees, but in California, there's a little over 1,600 species. So pretty good population of bees here. And there it is, just kind of zoomed in a little bit closer. And then one reason why this is a Mediterranean climate is most of the world gets their rain in the summer. And I'm sure you guys noticed it was raining recently. We get our rain in the winter. So that's another key factor for a Mediterranean climate. So normally like December through February is when we get our rain. Um, this is another thing that started happening in the Santa Monica Mountains that I think is really cool. Um, so the Santa Monica Mountains has decided to value land, not just as what can be developed, but as a healthy biodiverse ecosystem. So before anyone wants to develop on the land, the Santa Monica Conservancy gets to decide yes or no, um, saying whether or not this will be harmful to the ecosystem or beneficial. So I'm hoping what they'll do is just kind of leave the area as is um, and just let the area breathe so there's not as much development. So, yep. And then uh, Anza Brego. Um, this is one of the places where I, I started to see like major, major impacts of climate change. So this bee is called a Mega Kylie Brownie. It's a resin bee. It's in the same genus as leafcutter bees. So this one, instead of collecting leaves or rose petals or flower petals, they collect resin. But what's really cool about this bee is this photo is actually, um, I took it the year before last year. So this is the first living representative of this bee species. Um, and this bee is actually only been seen three times. And I took the photos home, showed them to my uh, one of my militologist friends just to get a confirmation. And he's like, oh, this is a really rare bee. And I was like, okay, I got to go back and get better photos of this bee. But the entire week that I, I wasn't able to go for like another week, but during the entire week, it had been about 110 degrees outside. And the plant that this bee was on is called a smoke bush or a smoke tree. It's supposed to look like this. And this is what it looked like. And this was only one of the two flowering bushes in the entire area. So the day that I went back, there was, um, it was 100 and I think 17 degrees. So it was pretty warm. Um, but as soon as I stepped out of my car, there was this just really, really loud hum. And these trees slash bushes were just swarming with honeybees. And the week I'd been there before, I saw about 100 different native bees. But the day I came back, I was like, I didn't see anything. And just miraculously, you can sort of see the, the clouds in the sky, but it started raining. And then all of the bees disappeared. And when it stopped raining, I got back out of my car, walked around on the bushes and I saw this one bee. This was the only Mega Kylie Brownie that I saw the second day I went there. She was just drying herself off from the rain. So this is an example of what can happen with climate change. Also um, honeybees potentially out in the wild, um, just over competing these native bees for resources. So this is something that you'll see happening a lot. And that brings me to native landscaping. This is my friend Paloma Jard. Um, so in her yard, it's really, um, I absolutely love her yard. So I, I went there and started documenting the bees. I've seen about 15 species in her yard, which I think is pretty average for most um, neighborhood yards um, with uh, native plants. So this first bee is a Xylocopa sonorina female. So you saw the male before, which was the orange large bee at Arlington. Um, this is a Agapostomon texanus, and she's collecting pollen on her back legs and her abdomen. This is a male Osmia bee or Mason bee. And this is a female Halictus farinosus. So she's a brown winged sweat bee. So these bees are all in her yard. But what's really cool, since she has this really established native habitat, she also has this bee. And this is a very rare bee. Um, I've seen it in one other place, just one individual, but she has a huge population. So this is called a Perdita interrupta on a Cal California poppy. So um, this bee has a symbiotic relationship with two plants. 
So it collects pollen from the poppies. And since poppies don't produce nectar, it also has to have a relationship with another plant, which is a popcorn plant. So with, these are really, really easy to photograph and see. The males spend their entire adult life hanging out on the poppy, just waiting for a female to show up. And then when a female shows up, the males just kind of pop on her. Um, another bee that she has in her yard. So this photo I actually took at the Crescent Farm, but after the first visit, I went to her yard, she saw this bee. So this is a Bombus crotchii, and it's one of the four endangered bumblebees in California. And it's just really cool because not only does she have a rare bee, but she also has an endangered bee in her yard. So this is what can happen if you just start creating a native ecosystem close to home. Um, also maintaining a native environment. Um, one great thing about maintaining a native environment is you don't need or you need less of pesticides and herbicides. So I'm sure you guys know this already, but pesticides kill insects that benefit plants, herbicides kill plants that benefit insects. So let's say for some reason, Paloma didn't like the Perdita interrupta in her yard and she started spraying pesticides. What would happen to the poppies? Let's say uh, she didn't like the poppies for some reason. I don't know why someone wouldn't, but she started putting the herbicides down. What would happen to the bees? Where would they go? So maintaining a native environment is really nice because um, it'll have a naturally healthy biodiverse ecosystem if you just kind of leave the plants and the animals there. So there's really little to no need for pesticides or herbicides. Um, so kind of like I was saying, these, these products can actually harm more than just their intended targets. And like an example I saw of this out in the wild too, is I, I go to Riverside a lot and there's houses up in the mountains there. And people, a lot of people feel like they have rodent problems, so they're putting out poison for the rodents, but that makes the rodents slow. Slower. So a lot of snakes, right? Snakes. Indicator insect, as I like to call it. So this wasp, if you have it in your yard or in your garden, it indicates that you have a healthy biodiverse ecosystem. So this is a very, very tiny wasp too. This is a male next to a quarter. You can see him right here. And then here is one at Arlington Garden. So this wasp is an indicator insect because its life cycle relies on a creature that a lot of people consider pests. So when you have a healthy biodiverse ecosystem, you're going to have a lot of creatures in your yard that you might not like, and one of them is an aphid. But you'll also have this wasp, which will control the population of the aphid. So what the females will do is they'll do something called ovipositing. So they'll stick an egg inside the body of the wasp or beside the body of the aphid, and the aphid's body will sort of balloon up, and it becomes a mummy where it doesn't move at all. And then when the, aphid, when the wasp is an adult, it'll do something called eclose or exiting the body of the aphid. And if you see any aphids that are kind of bloomed up like this and they have like a little cap on the back of them, you'll know that you have those wasps that are population control for the aphids. Um, another insect that you could have in your yard is a lacewing. So this is what the egg looks like on a little stalk here. This is the larva and the adult. So these also control populations of aphids. They also control thrift populations, millibugs, a lot of different things like that. Um, so yeah, these were photographed at the Crescent Farm, and this was in my friend's backyard. So she has a really good ecosystem as well. And this is what a thrift looks like. Very, very tiny creature. You can tell a tiny because the pollen grains. So this was a, another insect or creature I photographed at the Crescent Farm. And what's really cool about these two is um, I was talking about how ecosystem can be really small, like the two foot by two foot square area of sand mat on the neighborhood sidewalk. All of these creatures I photographed on one sunflower. So one sunflower can be an entire ecosystem. So again, ecosystems can be really, really small. Um, and as far as what to plant in your yard to attract certain bees, I just decided to include like some of the more popular plants. So we have buckwheat and salvia here, or areogonum and salvia, sage. Um, also a lot of flowers in the Asteraceae family, sunflowers. So bees that these plants will attract are Melisota's bees. So these are the longhorn bees. This is at Crescent Farm and they're sleeping on a sunflower. So if you have sunflowers in your yard, um, you'll see a lot of them grouped together sleeping there. 
Uh, so poppies, and this is the popcorn plant that I was talking about before. That's in my friend Loma's yard. So if you have these two plants together, um, you can potentially have this Perdita interrupta bee. So you might create a very good habitat for this very rare bee. And there's a close-up of a male. Oh, and again, you can tell he's a male because he has the Eclipius facial feature right there. And mallows. Mallows are really great because um, they provide a sleeping habitat for a lot of male diadacea bees or coletus bees, which are the bees with kind of the heart-shaped face. You can see a female in here. But what's really cool about these flowers is they open and close with the sun. So right before the sun's starting to go down, if you have this flower in your yard, look in them, you might see some bees tucking in them and then the flower will actually close around the bee. And then when the sun comes up the next morning, the flower will open and the bee will wake up and then come out. So here's an example of a male bee tucked into one of the flowers. And here's one that's about to wake up in the morning and come out. So yeah, these are Diadacia diminuta and I photographed them in California City in the Mojave. Um, squash plants, also really good plant for your backyard. Um, you might attract these bees. So these are more longhorn bees, but they are in the genus Eucera, which previously was called a they were previously in the genus Pepinapis, which is now the subgenus. Um, so these, the male, live their whole adult life in the flower. The female will nest below them. And this is a very, very early morning bee. So you have to go out before noon to look at these. The flowers open up right with the sun. So maybe like 6 a.m. And that's when you'll start to see them fly around. Um, this is red bud. Red bud, especially the leaves. Um, leaf cutters absolutely love these leaves. So if you ever notice these little cut cutouts on your leaves, and that's a sign of a leaf cutter. So this is a female who's actually taking this leaf back to her burrow. So this is a cavity nest member to protect her young that she's raising. Um, this is also a good plant to attract a lot of carpenter bees. Carpenter bees really love flowering trees. Um, grasses are also really important to bees. Uh, um, a lot of wasps as well. So this is Budalua gracilius, and this is one of my favorite grasses. So if you have this in your yard or if you see this out somewhere, this is a great plant for a lot of bees to sleep on. So these are some longhorn bees. So they're not sleeping on that plant, but I just kind of want to give you an example of what they look like on there. Um, these are two Anthophora um, urbana males. They're sleeping on flax. This is a nomada bee, which I know looks a lot like a wasp, but it's a, it's a parasitic bee, just like the Brachymolectica one, the one that looked like bird poop. Um, Pinstamen is another great flower. I see a lot of sweat bees on this one and also like a lot of um, bumblebees might visit them as well. But this is also a flower that a lot of bees will use to sleep in. So this is a sweat bee. Again, you can see the clippiest facial feature right here. He's a Helictus pharynosus and he was sleeping inside one of the Pinstamens. I kind of scared him when I moved the flower. So this is a good shot of him just hanging out on the top. And then another thing that's really important to do in your yard is um, leave plant stems. So 30% of bees are cavity nesting. So this bee is called a serotina or serotina, some people might say. This is the small carpenter bee. And these are about, about I'd say maybe seven to nine millimeters that live in the uh, pithy stems of plants. So if it's off season, kind of into the season for you, leave about 12 to 18 inches of plant stems and these bees will actually burrow into the plant stems and create little chambers for their future generations. Um, and here's a photo comparison of a male. You can see like the clippiest facial feature here to the female who just has a line. And she also has the plume hair, the branched hair on the back leg for pollen. And another thing that you could really do is leave the leaves. So leaves act as a blanket for overwintering creatures. So not just bees, but also like butterflies, a lot of creatures that actually burrow into the soil when it starts to get cold. So it acts as like a blanket, but it also leaves also help nourish the ground and give you like a healthy um, nutrient rich ground. So I always just recommend people like leave the leaves instead of picking everything up. I know a lot of people like really nice neat yards, but yeah, suggestion. Um, and then as far as bee houses, 
there's a lot of bee houses that are actually on the market right now that are not appropriate for bees. So if you're actually looking for a bee house, um, always, always get one that's at least, at least six inches deep and one that's very, very easy to clean. So the bee house that I always recommend is We Bee House. And they actually sent me one since I recommended them so often. But what's really good about these is, let's just say it's like kind of like a dog house and you have your dog living outside 24 seven, but you never clean it. That's really dirty for the dog. That's what a lot of people do for bee houses. So these houses are actually designed so you can take them apart and take the cavity cells apart and you can actually clean them. And at the top of the box, there is a little compartment where you can put the bee cocoons. Um, Cause what a lot of people don't realize is female bees will actually put male bees closer to the entrance of the burrow and females in the back. So that's typically why male bees are smaller than female bees. So if you are cleaning out your bee house and you're putting them back in the cells, you might be putting them back in the wrong order. So it's always good to get a bee box that has uh, one of these in the front or at least clean it out at the end of the year. Um, so this is an example of a product that kind of blew up online that was really, really popular for um, just a lot of people who wanted to help bees but also didn't know a lot about bees. So if you see here, this is only about four inches deep. So it's way too shallow for bees. Also, there's no way to clean it out. Um, I'd say the only good thing about these bee bricks is they were recommending that you put them up so high that bees were never going to have access to them. So this is what could happen if you don't clean out your bee house. So these mites, a lot of bees do have mites, but if you never clean out the bee house, these mites can build up on the bee so much that they can never actually fly and they could actually transport them to each other um, during mating. So always good to clean. Um, and these, these are some instructional videos. So I, I went through a lot of YouTube videos. So if you do see them, and then I guess another thing too that's really important is a lot of times with bee condos, people will say, oh, buy these cocoons. These are native bees. So just because like an osmia or a uh, leaf cutter bee is native to somewhere in the U.S. does not mean it's native to where you live. So I would always recommend not purchasing bees online. See here. Uh, another thing too is I kind of mentioned this before, but people like to leave for bees need but these photos. So if you do see a native bee that is grounded and needs resources. Um, so this is, I actually took this photo in my hand because I was trying to get a really good shot. So, and what I would recommend you doing is mixing three parts water, one part sugar, never use honey, and it'll actually perk the bee up really fast. This bee flew away in about five minutes. She was trapped in between the screen windows of my friend's house. But yeah, it's two other bees. So if, if you do have honeybees in your yard, you, there's maybe a honeybee that's on the ground too or is exhausted. I wouldn't give that bee honey unless you know it came from your hive. Uh, same thing with native bees. I wouldn't give them honey either. So um, just to wrap up here, I wanted to share a couple of my goals with you. I want to photograph the four endangered bumblebees in California. I photographed one so far, the easiest one. Um, I went to the Trinity Alps two years ago to photograph the second one, which actually hasn't been seen since 2006. I'm um, going back again this year and then going to try and for the other two as well in the Sierras. Also, I want to encourage more people to get into community science. So as of last year, there were 1,643 recognized species in California. I think it'd be great if when people think of bees, they think of more than just honeybees. Um, and then in regards to community science, I think this is a great example of what can happen if you encourage kids to get into community science. So a four-year-old in 2021 rediscovered 
a, it's, it's not a native bee, but rediscovered a bee that had not been seen for like 50 or 60 years in Palo Alto, California, because her aunt was a naturalist. So I just, I think it's really cool that you don't, there's no age limit on community science. So yeah, if you're in um, San Francisco area, you might see these bees there. Um, some other things, I also want to promote and create native landscaping bridges. So for example, with my friend Paloma's yard, she has that great ecosystem in her yard, but what if she moves and the people who move in decide to just put in a green lawn? Where are those bees going to go? If her neighbors put in little areas of native plants, those bees have basically like a bridge to go between different areas. So I, I think that's really important to maybe talk to your neighbors about as well. Um, I'm also working on a coffee table book as well as some uh, bee flashcards that um, hopefully the coffee table book will, I'll get all the photos at the end of this year, uh, the bee flashcards during a Kickstarter in March. Um, and then the last thing I want to leave you guys with, I just recently found out that this video only plays in the U.S. So hopefully you guys are all in the U.S. I think you're all in California, but this is a great documentary. It's a, a man's pandemic project, basically. He had a native yard. So he created this documentary called My Garden of a Thousand Bees. He's from Bristol, England. And it's just, it's so fascinating. It's free to watch on PBS. I just recommend everyone go and check it out. Um, it's so inter it's so entertaining. So yeah, My Garden of a Thousand Bees on PBS. Yes. Okay. Awesome. So yeah, thank you so much. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Oh, thank you. I have a couple of questions. Uh, the, <laughs> the, the bees with the chimneys, mm -hmm. um, how do I avoid stepping on them? How would I avoid knowing where their area is? So um, normally they're in aggregations. Ah, okay, cool. Um, other question, this is completely- so again, up. like the neighborhoods? Uh-huh. Okay. You cut in and out, so I'm sorry, sorry. Oh, sorry. No, it's okay. Did um, I answer the question? Hopefully. Oh, you did. Thank you. Uh, but I had a, one more other question, if I may, uh, mm -hmm. really quickly, and it's off topic. I noticed that you were drawing a motorcycle earlier. Do you draw cars too? Um, I haven't drawn a car yet, oh. but uh, I, I like motorcycles. I don't have a motorcycle, but I, I would love to get one one day. But yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank <you>. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> I, I will say that I put everybody on mute during the talk. So if uh, if people want to take themselves off mute now would be a good time and uh, to ask questions. In your drawings where you said you sugared, do you put something on the paper or take something away to do that? Oh no, I just I just lay it on the paper. So the image is made. Um, so it used to. Oh, wait, let me see if I can go back to that. So yeah, I just uh, I basically initially started out um, laying sugar on like a black piece of paper or canvas, oh, and then okay. I would record it. So I do a time lapse and wipe it away. Um, but people wanted to actually start buying them, so I had to figure out a way to save them, and I, I made like a combination of glue. So. Like this is another one. It's a honeybee, um, but yeah, they stay on the. Uh, that's a motorcycle, but yeah, they stay on the canvas now. Pretty neat. Yeah. Maybe it was your TED talk, but I know I've seen you um, with your artwork before and was very impressed. I, I'm very impressed with that and the bee and the bees. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Uh, Crystal, Can I go through the chat, maybe? Crystal, oh, yeah. that was a wonderful talk. Um, make sure that we are in communication. I have some other questions I would like to ask you personally. Uh, a lot of people are curious mm -hmm. about what equipment you were using, and okay. you mentioned a lot of links. I would like to forward all those links 
uh, to everybody that was here tonight and everybody on my list. So okay. make sure that we can communicate all of that information so I can spread it around. Um, there was some bandwidth issues. Your bandwidth oh. is not very good. And there were a, a lot of interruptions. Uh, so, uh, but, but the talk was wonderful as one of the best talks I've seen in quite a while. Okay. So yes. I really appreciate it. Um, and the photography is fantastic. Um, so thank you very much for the presentation and no please let's stay in touch i had some other questions for you okay yeah did you guys want me to do any questions or answer anything about the equipment or just do it later well i i am a nature photographer probably half of us are and we're probably curious about what equipment you're using um okay i actually have let me see if i can open this up and show you guys um I actually have a, because I also do talks on photography, so I actually have something with the equipment shown, so I can show you guys. Okay, let's see here. Almost there. <laughs> um, is this it? Okay, here we go. All right, is that showing up for everyone? Yes. Yes. Okay, so I recommend like different equipment for different people depending on where they are. So this is, um, I started out shooting, honestly, with like a Samsung S6, but uh, before I actually invested in my camera, you can get these little clip-on attachments for your phone, and iPhones actually came out with uh, an app that goes along with it, so you can shoot in RAW, so you can edit your photos in uh, Lightroom, but yeah, you can get these on Amazon for like, I think, 10 to like 30 bucks, um, but yeah, like these are the photos that you can Dang. Oh, uh, they can't. You're all out of focus, though. So. Oh, I should. What? Take with it. It's just because like, it leaves the shape of a ring on whatever you're photographing. Um, I used to use dual flashes, but I had them on like arms, so they would kind of like I could move them wherever. It was really great for lighting, um, but you have to get like soft boxes for diffusion. And then another, I used a 0.3 millimeter polypropylene sheet, or you can use like some thick white paper to shoot through so it doesn't have the hot spot. But uh, I dropped three pounds when I got rid of uh, these two flashes and now use a single flash. Um, so this was my setup when I had the two arms. So again, you see the soft boxes and then this diffuser, which I just cut out. Um, it's a front shot. And then as far as the diffusers, I use the Cygnus Tech diffuser for my single flash. Um, this is really great because it has a little light that you can use for focusing because a lot of times, it, mainly you're shooting manual when you're doing um, photography. So this really helps you focus. Um, but AK diffuser, it's, it's cheaper. Um, <clears throat> I personally have never used it, but I've heard a lot of good things about it. So either one of those. Um, so the diffuser is basically, I'm sure you guys actually I have pictures of it. So this is a, uh, Anthophora sleeping photo that I took without a diffuser. So this is a hot spot. So it's basically a area void of any information. Um, this is a stacked photo, by the way. And this is a, a photo I took in the Trinity Alps the year before last year. So again, it's, it's really soft features that are wrapped around. It's just a single shot, but you don't have that hot spot there. Um, and then the camera body I use right now is a, a Nikon D500, which is a crop sensor. But I think with the way cameras are like they're developing so quickly every year, you don't need to get a crop sensor anymore to take photos of small things. Um, this is the camera I'm going to get. I was hoping it'd go down in price because it's been out for a year, but it hasn't dropped a dollar. So I'm just going to get it. Um, it's probably going to drop as soon as I buy it. But this is a Nikon <laughs> Z5, Z9, uh, which is a full frame mirrorless. And this camera is just amazing. And one thing that's great about this, I'm sure a lot of you guys who are photographers know, but like 
when you shoot at really high ISOs, you get like a lot of grainy images with like the new Sony and then the new Nikon mirrorless cameras. You don't have that issue anymore. I've seen people shoot at like 3000 ISO, which is just ridiculous. I normally shoot around a hundred, um, but they're not getting any grain. And I think that's just like, that's amazing. Um, and then as far as my primary lens, this is a Nikkor 105. So I'm sure I got to let you guys know what the 105 means anyway. But uh, so I like to use a 105 because that's basically the distance from the back of the lens to whatever subject you're shooting. So when you're shooting a lot of flying things, they'll like fly away from you if you get too close. So instead of like a 50 millimeter, I think this is a great lens to use. Um, yeah. And then this is another one that I think if I would have known more about lenses when I first was starting out, I probably would have gotten this one opposed to the Nikkor. I think it's a lot sharper. Um, also, it has autofocus as well. So if you do want to use autofocus, I think it's a little bit faster because I know um, with the, the Nikkor, it focus hunts a lot. So you can potentially use a shot, lose a shot if you're shooting in autofocus. Um, Reverse ring mount. These are really cool if you don't want to buy a new, like a macro lens. So you can actually um, take whatever lens you're currently using and just like take it off your camera, flip it around and attach it with this reverse ring mount, which could be like 20 bucks. Um, it's basically like, you know, you look through binoculars and everything like it's basically like turning your binoculars around and shooting this way. So it makes everything turns your lens into a macro lens. Um, also extension tubes. I don't use these um, just because I shoot primarily with something over 70 millimeters. I feel like if you're shooting like under 70 millimeters, these would be something that you would use. So they just get you a lot closer to whatever it is you're uh, taking pictures of. Um, but yeah, you can stack all three of these on top of each other. It's they're really great for short focal lengths. Um, so this is a diopter I use. And um, so this is a Raynox 105. I put it on the front of my I'm 150. Sorry, I put it on the fr front of my uh, Nikkor 105. Um, these are some of the shots that I got with it. So you can get like a full body of a bee um, flower. Took that photo with it as well. Uh, this is the 250s. So this for smaller bees so you can get it for like bee flower this is a really cool lens so if you want to get um take photos that tell stories I would 100% recommend this one so this is a Lauer 15 millimeter and what's cool about it is you can basically touch the front of this lens and whatever is like touching the lens will actually be in focus but you'll get the full background as well um so this is an example so this flower I know you can't tell but it's practically touching the lens it's in focus but you get the whole background this is the crescent farm um so the same thing with this is a, a vulnerable vulnerable bumblebee bombus sonoris at madrona marsh there's another sleeping bombus sonoris at madrona marsh as well um and i just started taking photos of like areas that were sort of suburban um just to kind of get perspective of the bees uh, this is my Lawa 25 millimeter. So I only use this to photograph things that are under five millimeters. Um, so this does come with a ring light, but again, it leaves that circle hot spot. So if you have the diffuser that has the focus lamp, you don't need it. Um, so this is a last year blossom dialectus that I photographed with this. So really, really shallow depth of field, but you get really cool photos of small things. Um, this was the Perdita Interrupta photographed in my friend's backyard. Um, also used it for the Perdita Minima. Um, yeah. Cool. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much for um, your talk. It was uh, it was fascinating and beautiful. I really appreciated seeing so many of those smaller bees, the native bees that are um super pretty those perdita ones and mm -hmm. just uh yeah thank you because um unless you're really looking you don't see them in media mm -hmm. so i feel like i for one just saw a whole mess of bees that uh i've never seen before thank you <laughs> yeah no problem i love your setup by the way that's a oh, thank you. cool like library <laughs> <laughs> thanks yeah it's a it's a pretty chill spot 
<laughs> okay, we can uh, we can forward any information that Crystal provides us. Uh, we can uh, ask other questions online. Um, and uh, we will also continue the business discussions um, through email or offline. Uh, thank you all for participating. Anybody else have any questions or issues? Do you have a list of native plants that you suggest um, you know, planting? You mentioned certain grasses. Is there like your website? Do you have like a list of California plants or anything? I can actually, um, I didn't create a list, but UC Berkeley created a extensive list that I just send to people um, okay. because I was like, I don't need to reinvent the will. Right. Um, so I can actually send that to you guys. Um, but yeah, it has a really long list of plants. So yeah, I'll send that to you guys. Great, thank you.